Shabbat Shalom. It's pretty loud, huh? <laughs> Welcome everyone to Rosh Pina uh, on the Shabbat. Uh, we begin our service with Bar Shalkitite, which means when you go. And Torah portion comes to us from Deuteronomy chapter 21 through chapter 25. The Torah portion today details many instructions by God. He begins with the instruction and explanation of the laws of the beautiful captive, the inheritance rights of the firstborn, the wayward and rebellious son, burial and dignity of the dead, returning a lost object, sending away the mother bird before taking her young, the duty uh, to erect a safety fence around the roof of one's home, and the various forms of forbidden plants and animal hybrids. Also recounted are the judicial procedures and penalties for adultery, for the rape or seduction of an unmarried girl and for a husband who falsely accuses his wife of infidelity. Moreover, the Israelites were instructed to not allow a Moabite or Ammonite into the congregation of the Lord till their tenth generation, for they did not greet the Israelites with food and water on their journeys. Furthermore, the Torah portion discussed laws including governing the purity of the military camp, the prohibition against turning in an escaped slave, and the duty to pay a worker on time. This portion ends with the obligation to remember what Amalek did to you on the road on your way out of Egypt. The Haftarah portion comes to us from Isaiah chapter 54, 1 through 10. This week's Haftarah begins with God speaking through the prophet Isaiah by comparing Israel to a barren woman with no children. God encourages her to rejoice, though for the time will soon come when the land of Israel will have more children than the married woman. He continues by stating, enlarge the place of thy tent and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine inhabitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords and strengthen thy stakes, for thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles, and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is thy name, and thy redeemer of the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth shall be called. The after ends with God comforting his people by stating, For the mountains shall depart, the hills shall be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. The uh, Brit Kadasha portion comes to us from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent, that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot, and blameless. The parasha this week discussed the theme of faith and hope. Through the remembering of what the Moabites and Ammonites did to the Israelites and the charge given by Isaiah to Israel, we see how God was seeking to instill a trusting relationship between him and Israel. Likewise, I believe he desires that same level of trust and faith in him from us today. Regardless of what is occurring around us globally or personally, we must stay aligned with God and not swayed by any doubts or fears spoken of by the enemy. Let us praise him today for his constant protection and guidance. Amen. Shofarim. Most holy Abba, majestic Father, we come before you in the name of your Son, Yeshua. Lord, we ask your forgiveness for our many sins. That, Lord, that the blood covering of Yeshua you have allowed to cover our sins, and that we may come into your presence to learn to know you to worship you, to hear you, 
that you have chosen us to be your people. Abba Father, we sit at your feet today. We thank you that you've given us this place and this family where we can come, that we can learn of you and know of you and rest at your feet. Lord, you give us so many blessings. And Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy upon your people. Lord, we thank you for all of the people in the world, Lord, that know you and love you. And Lord, we ask your protection on your people. And Lord, we thank you that you give strength and help to those who are in need. And Lord, let us never take for granted all that you have given us each and every second of every day. Lord, we worship you, we love you, and we pray that our worship today would be a sweet-smelling savor to you. And that, Lord, we would know that you are our God, the one who created each and every one of us, who created the universe, Lord. There is none like you. In Yeshua's precious name, amen. Let us stand together. And begin today's worship. For how lovely are the tents of Jake and the dwelling places of Israel. Therefore with joy we shall draw water from the wells of salvation. You may be seated. All right, Shabbat Shalom. All right, we begin this with the Baruch Hu. Baruch Hu at Adonai Hamvarach. Baruch Adonai Hamvarach Le'olam Vayed. Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One for all eternity. The children of Israel shall keep the Shabbat, observing it throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Shabbat to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Bless you, Mashiach Yeshua, together. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher natan lanu ederech hayeshua b'mashiach Yeshua. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the way of salvation, Messiah Yeshua. 
Amen. May all stand for the Shema. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kavon The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever. Amen. Vehafta et Adonai Lohecha, Bo Kola Vavkov, Kol Nafshakov, Kol Mudekam. Vahayu Hadvarim Ha'ele, Asher Anukim Hatzav Gahayom, Al Lavaveka. Vashina Tan Leveneka, Vidabartabam, Vashitaka, Bevitaku, Vletka Vadderak, Ushapka Ukumeka, Usha Tom Yota Yadaka, Vahayla Totov Bena Neka, Uta Tom Mazot Beteka, Uvisharecha. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Bahafta, Lariaka, Kamoka. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Blessed are you, O Lord our God and God of our fathers, God of Avraham, God of Yitzchak, and God of Yaakov. The great, mighty, and awesome God, the most high God, bestows grace and creates all, and remembers the kindnesses of the fathers, and brings a Redeemer to the children's children for his name's sake with love. O King, help your Savior and shield. Blessed are you, O Lord, shield of Avraham. You are eternally mighty, my Lord, the resurrector of the dead are you, abundantly able to save who sustains the living with kindness, resurrects the dead with abundant mercy, supports the fallen, heals the sick, releases the confined, and maintains his faith to those asleep in the dust. Who is like you, O master of mighty deeds, and who is comparable to you, O king, who causes death and restores life and makes salvation sprout? Our God and God of our fathers, May you be pleased with our rest, sanctify us in your commandments, and grant us our portion in your Torah. Satisfy us from your goodness, and make us rejoice in your salvation, and purify our hearts to serve you in truth, in love and favor, O Lord our God, grant us your holy Shabbat, as the heritage of May Israel, who sanctifies your name, rest therein. Baruch atah Adonai, Megadesh Shabbat. Blessed are you, O Lord, who makes the Shabbat holy. Magnified and sanctified be his great name in the world which he has created according to his will. May he establish his kingdom during your life and during your days and during the life of the whole house of Israel, even swiftly and soon, and all say, Amen. Let his great name be blessed forever and to all eternity. Blessed, praised, and glorified, exalted, extolled, and honored, magnified, and lauded be the name of the Holy One. 
Blessed is he, though he be high above all blessings and songs, praises and consolations which are uttered in the world, and all say, Amen. May you make peace in his high places, make peace upon us, upon all Israel, and say, Amen. Imru Amen O say Shalom Bimru Ma Hu Ya Se Shalom Aleinu Ve'yacho Yisrael Vimru Imru Shalom, ya se shalom, shalom aleinu, v'yacho Yisrael. Ya se shalom, ya se shalom, shalom aleinu, v'yacho Yisrael. Yase shalom, yase shalom, shalom aleinu v'yacho Yisrael. Yase shalom, yase shalom, shalom aleinu v'yacho Yisrael. May he who makes peace in high places make peace for Israel for all mankind and say, Amen.
Your name is holy. Your name is holy. Your name is holy. Oh, and great is the Lord God Almighty. Great is the Lord on high. The train of His robe fills the temple, and we cry out, "Highest praise, glory to the risen King, glory to the Son." Lift up your hands, open the doors, let the King of glory come in and forever be our God. Lift up your hands, open the doors, let the King of glory come in and forever be our God. And holy is the Lord God Almighty.
praise you and thank you for today father lord we ask and seek your face today father lord, we ask that you would just allow all distractions lord all concerns that are of this world to fade away let our minds and our spirits and our hearts father god be solely and firmly focused on you today in the kingdom. If faith can move the mountains, then the mountains move. We've come with expectations waiting here for you waiting here for you you're the lord of all creation and still you know my heart the author of salvation Faithfulness is true. We're dead before your presence. All we need is you. Oh, yes. Oh, we're waiting here for you. With our hands lifted high.
lifted high, oh, in praise, it's you, we adore, singing We're desperate for. God, thank you that we can come into your house today. Thank you for the freedom that we have to openly worship you. We have heard the Spirit's call, God. We have heard you say, come, come to me so I can feed your souls. And today, we come desperate for you. Come with expectation to meet with you because our hearts desire to be with you. We are one when we are with you. Speak today from your throne room. Change each heart that stands before you today. May your name be lifted up and may you be glorified above all things. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Vahib and Sawaha Aram. When the ark would travel, Moshe would say, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let them that hate you flee from you. For out of Zion shall go forth the Torah, and the word of the Lord from Yerushalayim. Blessed be he who in his holiness gave the Torah to his people, Yisrael. Yamod Yehuda ben Aliyahu la Torah. Baruch Adonai Hamvarach. Baruch Adonai Hamvarach Leolam Vayed. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Asher bachar benu mikol hamim v'natan lanu et torato Baruch atah Adonai notein ha-torah Bless the Lord, the Blessed One Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One for all eternity Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe who has chosen us from all peoples and given us his Torah Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah Yaladim Tov Yaladim. What was that? Go ahead. Go ahead, say it, Sam. Go ahead, Joe. Say it, Joe. Okay, all right, okay. Thank you, O oh Lord, for these blessed children and the families that they represent. May they be blessed abundantly as Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, Ephraim, and Manasseh. Lord, I ask that a hedge of protection be around each and every one of them, keeping them safe from sickness, keeping them out of the way of harm. Lord, we just thank you for them, Lord. They're such a blessing. Lord, as they grow and mature physically, Lord, we ask that you would draw them near to you. They would realize who you are, Yeshua, and they would receive you as their Messiah. And Lord, as they grow and mature in the faith, that you would surround them with godly men and women who will assist them on their life's journey as servants to you. In Yeshua's name, amen. Kitatsela <laughs> The Gilcha et Rasha Vasta et Ziparnea. When thou goest forth to war against thine enemies, and the Lord thy God hath delivered them into thine hands, and thou hast taken them captive. 
and seest among the captives a beautiful woman, and hast a desire unto her, that thou wouldest have her to thy wife, then thou shalt bring her home to thine house, and she shall shave her head and pare her nails. Amen. Amen. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu, Torah timet v'chai olam, natah betukhenu, Baruch atah Adonai, noten ha-Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the Torah of truth and has planted eternal life within us. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. V'zot ha-Torah, asher sem Moshe, lifnei b'nei Yisrael, al pi Adonai, biad Moshe. And this is the Torah that Moses placed before the children of Israel at the command of the Lord through Moses' hand. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This Torah scroll is the Word of God. Yeshua is this Word. John the Immerser said in John 1.29, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God's Word is written on lambskin. Yeshua is this Lamb. In John 12, 32, Yeshua said, And I, if, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. The two wooden poles holding this Torah scroll are called Eitz Chaim, or Tree of Life. Yeshua was sacrificed on two wooden poles some 2,000 years ago for our sins. Eitz Chaim Hi, Lemachazakim Ba. Vitam Keo Meushar, Darke Nakenu Am. It is a tree of life to those, who, to those who take hold of it, and happier those who support it. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Cause us to return to you, Adonai, we shall return. Renew our days as of old. Revelation 2.7 reads, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the congregations. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Yeshua was, is, and shall ever be this word of the one living God that we look upon this day for our salvation. May all be seated. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. So, as we all know, it's been quite a week in the news. We've seen a lot going on in the world around us, um, here in the United States itself, but certainly abroad. Um, it's uh, been a week of a lot of contention a lot of despair and anger, and rightfully so. Um, things aren't looking too good out there, to be honest. You can just, you know, I, I kind of reflected last night on this past week and the news stories that are out there. There was three that I really think came to mind that I think is probably at the forefront of everyone's thoughts. Um, Afghanistan is obviously the biggest one, but that, that's the second one I'm going to mention here. Um, while no one's really kind of saying this, it dawned on me, though, the, you know, the, obviously COVID's been with us for a, quite a while. And um, we're actually, if you think about when the lockdowns, the first lockdowns that occurred way back in March 2020. So we're a few weeks from a year and a half of dealing with this. And it kind of, you know, I've, we've all been saying like a year, a year, but actually it's now a year and a half. That we're coming up on and certainly I think we're all suffering from the fatigue of dealing with this virus one way or another and especially you know not and not even always directly dealing with it we obviously we, you know we have had some members in the congregation um, that have, ha have caught it and praise God that they've all recovered from it and that they are doing okay um, but you know there's a lot of indirect influences as well that COVID's having on us 
the reality is for a certain portion of the population, um, certain people, fear. They're still gripped by a fear of, of this virus. And the potential, um, again, you know, and I've, I've, one of the first people to point out, compared to many other types of plagues and illnesses that have hit humanity over the centuries and millennia, this actually isn't that bad of one. But, you know, we, we still have to acknowledge hundreds of thousands of people have died from it. And it still continues, I don't think it's the threat it was six months ago, definitely a year ago, but it still is out there. But even more so, we're now seeing communities and maybe even the nation as a whole kind of being torn apart by how do we now live with coronavirus, with COVID being out there. We see the biggest fights seem to be over vaccinations and um, over still over masking. Um, especially with a lot of the children going back to school right now. You're seeing um, at a lot of school boards, a lot of contention um, uh, over the fights over, over whether masking should be mandated or not, um, not, you know, or make it volunteer, whatever. We see splits really developing in all of these debates between those who are ready to move on with their lives. They're saying this is just how we have, you know, something we have to live with now. It may always be out there. It's not going to be as bad as it was, but it's always going to be out there. Um, versus those who are still paralyzed by fear of it and are, are quite worried about going out. Of course, these, um, along with the vaccinations and the masking, you know, there's questions like, are we going to see another round of lockdowns? There's threats of lockdowns. We see in some states where that is occurring. Are they going to require vaccine passports to be able to interact or not? Um, and all these are real discussions going out. That, of course, it does depend what country, what state you live in. You live in a place like Australia, New Zealand, where there's a zero tolerance, essentially. You know, one case, you know, Zealand, New Zealand, if you read the news about them, essentially one case is intolerable to them, and so they are going to shut down everything just over one person having it. It's part of the advantage of living on an island where you can do that, if, if that's really the way you want to go. Um, but we, you know, we see it in other ways, and unfortunately, of course, it is a reality, but it also breeds a lot of conspiracy theories and false news stories that are running amok out there as well. And, and you know, anyone, you got to be careful on social media these days. And, you know, I, I think there's the old adage my dad always taught, he said he learned it in the Army, um, and he always taught it to me, and I've always kind of lived by it, is um, trust nothing that you hear and only half of what you see. And I think that's a good policy as you go out. Don't trust anything you hear just because, especially if what you hear confirms what you already believe. You've all, we all have heard of confirmation bias. We're more inclined to automatically believe something that we already, already aligns with what we think. Question everything, regardless of who the source is. Of course, we're also dealing with these massive disruptions to our economy because of the pandemic. Um, we can think about, you know, the, uh, the big thing seems to be now the understaffing. Everywhere you go, it seems everyone's understaffed. Um, I know um, I've been, Shelley and I have experienced going out to a restaurant and there was like eight people in the restaurant. They still said it was going to be a 15 minute wait to be seated. And we were like, what? <laughs> Why? And the, you know, the guy was very honest. He said, to be honest, I, you know, I only have two staff, waiting staff, and my, um, my cook is threatening to quit tonight. So you decide if you want to stay or not. So we have the understaffing. The understaffing is also creating supply chains and logistic problems, so um, we're seeing shortages and resources pop up in different parts of the economy. And of course, there's the ever-growing threat of inflation that we're now facing. We see, um, especially in some sectors, how pricing has just gone through the roof. So all of this was already there. It was already like, you know, the pot boiling for a year and a half with all this contention. And then this week, we get the news of the collapse of Afghanistan. And I think for many people, this came out of nowhere. Now, if you're a political news junkie like me and listen to a lot of podcasts, I actually haven't been surprised by any of this. I, uh, there's certain podcasters I listen to talk with that saying this is where we're going to be. And they were talking about this six months ago, that this is where we're going to be. Um, actually, there's one group I listened to, they were saying a year ago this is where we're going to be. But for many, this came as a surprise. Taliban, Al-Qaeda, those were things that were supposed to be dealt with. We really haven't heard much about them in the news um, for the last several years. Um, but what do we see? We turn on the news and you see, we see the collapse of a society into the hands of truly evil men. Men who have no, only the intention of doing harm to others. 
We saw those horrific images. Um, for those old enough, I'm not old enough, but I read history, so I'm well aware, but those of you maybe old enough remember the evacuation of Saigon. Um, back in the 70s when we had when we pulled out of Vietnam this seems to be much worse than even those images where you had we saw people chasing after planes and grabbing on and even falling from them and stories I heard thankfully no images of when the plane landed finally um, when they checked the, the wheels the gears because um, they had raised the wheels at some point in the flight mangled arms and, and limbs that had been torn off from people that were clinging to it because they're so desperate we've seen the images of mothers uh, at the crowds of gates handing their children over them just you know willing to make that sacrifice having no idea where, what's going to happen to that child because the unknown of being in American or Western hands is better than the known what they know they're going to face um, being there um, remaining in Afghanistan. We hear the stories of rape and the essential enslavement of women again um, there in the country. So we just see this complete collapse and we see a, a, um, government leaders that just refuse to acknowledge what's going on or acting like it's no big deal. You know, I, I hate to say it, and I, I try to keep politics out of my teaching as much as I can, but when our president's responding to a reporter who's asking questions, why are you still talking about that? That was like four or five days ago. Well, no, th this should be something we should be talking about for months, if not years, about how the catastrophe this is. And of course, this just adds to our fears and our worries because we have this threat now of a reemergence of a terrorist safe haven in the Middle East um, that we thought, you know, like I said, many thought they had gone away. I was um, at work on Monday. I went down to the uh, subway um, in the cafeteria area to get lunch. And the new, they have TVs running in there. It was still pretty quiet because classes start this week. And um, the news was on it. And they were talking about the Afghanistan story. And, you know, this really kind of just broke on Sunday. And I remember hearing one of the staffers, like, all of a sudden it caught their attention. And they were like, they must not have heard the news, like, the day prior. They are like, the Taliban? They're still around? I thought they were dealt with. I mean, someone, you know, actually said that. So now, and again, then... We're only a couple weeks away from the 20 year anniversary of 9-11 that started all of that. And now we're, it seems like we're right back to where we were 20 years ago. So we have all of this going on in the world. Then a third event that I, I don't even know how many people saw it because it's been buried by everything else. Last Shabbat, last Saturday, there was a horrible earthquake that hit Haiti, 7.2. Um, they're saying 2,200 dead, that's the current count, and they're expecting it to rise, over 12,000 injured. Um, they said the three worst regions of the country that hit by the earthquake, estimating 61,000 homes have been destroyed because of it. Then the earthquake hits, after that, then the uh, you had a major tropical storm that ran through the country, um, then a few days later, causing flash flooding, landsliding, this is blocking um, the relief that's trying to get get to the country, um, the supply chains are being disrupted by all of this. What you may not have known is that this is on top of what the Haitians are experiencing, this is on top of already political upheaval in their country. Just last month in July, their president was assassinated. And so there has been a, an upheaval in that country. Crime was on the rage, was up, what was on the, on the rise. I mean, we've been dealing with a rise of crime here in the United States, nothing compared to what Haiti has been experiencing. And now, as I was reading last night, there's these fears of the outbreaks of disease um, in the country. Now, not just talking about COVID, but so things that are even more serious. Um, I read one article, they said back in 2010, and some of you may remember there was a horrible earthquake that hit Haiti back then. Um, 11 years ago. They said 10,000 people during that earthquake alone died from cholera in the weeks following. So they're expecting another rise there. So when we look out on the world, we see these events unfolding. And in many ways, they really appear beyond our grasp, you know, beyond our measure to even grasp, like what's truly going on out there? How can we, we can't even really grasp it yet alone, how are you gonna control it? How do you get a control of these things? And when we're confronted with this type of world situation where everything is just beyond us, everything's beyond our control, there's nothing I can do as an individual. Even Shelly and I were talking when we were looking at what happened at Haiti. Our hearts went out and we were like, well, what can we do? And we'd like to do something more than just give money. And give, giving money is important. But, you know, um, you know we've not shared this, and, and I, I only share it just to kind of illustrate the point. Um, 
we sponsor a child down in Haiti through Compassion International. So we are been lit by listening to Compassion International. We've gotten a few emails giving updates, but we want to know about this child John who lives down there um, because we're like, well, we want to see what can we do to directly aid his family or directly aid the school that he attends. You know, we want to make like a, a tangible difference. But there's no information coming out. I mean, reality is we don't even know. We assume John's okay because he wasn't in near the epicenter of where the earthquake hit. But we're like, we don't even know if his family or he's o or he is okay. And so you feel like even something small like that, where like we want to do something directly, but we don't know how to. So everything seems beyond our control. And when we feel that way, there's two, usually two responses that you have. You either want to re just retreat from it all, retreat into your homes, retreat maybe into your local communities. You have a strong uh, community, especially one of faith, like we have here at Roche Pina. You want to retreat into those and just say, shut it all out. Let it, you know, that's what the world is dealing with. I'll just take care of myself. I'll take care of my family. I'll take care of my direct community. So that's one reaction. The other reaction is you want to do, you, again, because you want to do something, you want to go out and fight. You want, you're, you're like, you know, all this disaster, somebody's got to get control. I want to do my part, and so I want to contribute to fighting to get control of all of this. So those are the two reactions that we often feel in these situations. But the question for us as disciples of the Mashiach, of course, should be, well, which one's right? Or, or is either one right or, or in that? You know, what should we be doing in times of great disruption and upheaval and contention, such as we see in the world today? Should we retreat? Should we draw in? Should we fight? Should we get out there and make a difference? Should we disconnect from it all? Or should we increase our engagement and try to increase our influence out there? Well, personally, I'm one who believes different situations require different reactions. I'm very much against one-size-fit-all solutions. And so I think there, you have to kind of determine, well, what is the specific situation? How do you react? But even though I automatically assume one response is, always, is not always superior to another, I can say confidently, though, that before we decide anything, before we decide, well, what's the proper reaction in this response, there is a commandment in the scriptures that we need to be aware of and that we should take heed to when we find ourselves surrounded by disruption and disheaval. And of course, that's what's up on the screen there. There is the command, be still and know that I am Elohim. I am God. Now this command comes from Psalm 46, and we're going to go through Psalm 46 verse by verse and really look at what God, what David singing this psalm was saying about God and the nature of God and our relationship to him. But we, before we get in that passage, I want us first to look at another instance, another time, where it seemed like the world was about to catch on fire. And what did God speak to his people during that time? So we're going to go to the um, book of Jeremiah. We'll start with Jeremiah 1, 11 through 16, which says, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, What do you see, Jeremiah? And I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. And the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. And the word of the Lord came to me a second time, saying, What do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot facing away from the north. And the Lord said to me, Out of the north the evil will be unleashed on all the inhabitants of the land. For behold, I am calling all the families of the kingdom of the north, declares the Lord. And they will come in place, each one of them, his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem, and against all its walls around, and against all the cities of Judah. And I will pronounce my judgments against them concerning all their wickedness, since they have abandoned me and have offered sacrifices to other gods, and worship the works of their own hands. So, when God speaks to Jeremiah here, he first you know, asks, what do you see? And Jeremiah says, I see an almond branch, or a branch of an almond tree. Now, what's the significance of that? What, you know, why was God pointing out to Jeremiah this almond branch? Well, the almond branch represents, it was an indication that God's judgment was quickly approaching. There wasn't going to be much time left 
wasn't going to be much time for, for people to repent, much time for people to prepare for the judgment, it, but because it, it was quickly there. This was the, um, and the reason that the almond tree is used is because in that region of the world, the almond tree is the first one to bud or produce fruit or droop at the very beginning of spring. Of all the trees, we often talk about because Yeshua used the fig tree as the, um, to, you know, for judging the seasons. Um, but the almond tree is actually the very first tree to bud and then produce fruit in that region. And so that's why God is using that here because it, it, it's that first sign that his judgment's coming and it's coming quickly. Now the judgment that was coming upon Judah at this time to the people of Israel it was the Babylonians. And God, as we you read through Jeremiah, you see, you know, God is, is warning the people that the Babylon, Babylonians are going to be coming and they are going to conquer the lands, first around the land of, all around Judah, and then eventually they would even overcome Jerusalem. The war and the devastation they would bring was shown, therefore, it, the sign was the almond branch, but it was shown that it was a boiling pot to Jeremiah, as we just read. And, you know, very much like many today probably see the world or their own lives as a boiling pot of water. It feels like we're in a in that boiling pot where we're like, well, when's it going to finally just overflow? Obviously, if you were in Afghanistan, the, the pot has overflown at this point. It's probably it's tipped over and everything. But here in the United States, we're still relatively safe, but we see, we feel a lot of the contention. We feel like we're in this boiling pot of water. We see wars, we see protests and stability, arguing and fighting over every, every direction you turn. And we have to wonder, well, when's this water going to finally boil over and just scorch everything? Yet this is not the end of God's words to Jeremiah. And it's important. You can't just read these verses and say, uh-oh, judgment's coming. Now what do we do? God had more to say here. And so God speaks of his quick judgment coming against Judah for its idolatry. But he also spoke of his remembrance. And that, uh, God spoke of his love for Jerusalem and for all of Israel. He reminds the people, even though my judgment's coming, I still love you. And thus, in, even when he proclaims and he shows that judgment's coming, he's reminding them, my mercy is still there as well. Jeremiah 2, 1 through 3 states, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and proclaim the years in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, This is what the Lord says. I remember regarding you the devotion of your youth, your love when you were a bride, your following after me in the wilderness, through a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first of his harvest. All who ate of it became guilty. Evil came upon them, declares the Lord. So he says, you know, I still remember our, my relationship with you. This is a promise that mercy will still be there in the judgment. But God goes then even further in, in the text. And God speaks directly to Jeremiah and he tells him, you're going to have to deliver a very difficult message to the people of Israel, or specifically the people of Judah, because it is a message of judgment. It's a message that your sin has now gone so far I can no longer look away, I can no longer tolerate it in my mercy, and judgment has to come. And you're going to be delivering this to a people who are corrupt. They're idolatrous. The leaders of Judah um, had led, Israel, had led them, the, the people of Israel so far away from Torah and the way of rightful worship of God that this is going to be a difficult message to deliver them. And he tells Jeremiah right up front, you're going to be hated for this. But he says, God says to him, you're to remain steadfast and you remain confident, confidence against the assaults that are going to be leveled against you. Because, and God says, because I'm going to strengthen you. And I'm going to strengthen you against anything you're going to face. Jeremiah 1, 17 through 19 says, Now, belt your garment around your waist and arise. Speak to them all that I command you. Do not be dismayed before them, or I will make you dismay dismayed before them. Now behold, I have made you today like a fortified city, like a pillar of iron and walls of bronze against the whole land, to the kings of Judah, to its leaders, to its priests, to the people of the land. And they will fight against you, but they will not overcome you. For I am with you to save you, declares the Lord. So these words here spoken to Jeremiah, but also it was to Jeremiah, but it was also to the righteous of Judah, who had remained holy and separate unto God. 
To take the, those th three verses there, you could really sum it up with the title, this commandment we're going to be looking at, is that God is telling them, be still and know that I am God. I am Elohim. God says here that they're not to be fear fearful in the face of adversaries. Or to be fearful in the face of ju the judgment that's going to be being carried out ar around them. He also s is saying to them, you're not to look for strength from within. Don't look for, you know, if you're going to withhold or, or stand throughout this time, this difficult time that's coming, you're not going to be able just to rely on the strength that comes from within. Likewise, you're not going to be able to rely on the strength that comes from others, from outside sources. And, he's, and, and here, but as we go through the entire book of Jeremiah, they're constantly told, you're not to fight against my coming judgments, because this is my will. He also, God will also tell him in Jeremiah, you're not to flee from those judgments either. They are really not supposed to react to them in any other, in any way, other than simply to be still and wait for God to either move or to instruct. And that's the kind of the theme of the entire book of Jeremiah. If you were to boil it down to just one, and there's many, but if you had to boil it down to one, that's what I would argue it is. It is. Be still, wait for God to move, and wait for God to instruct. And I think it's important, especially when we think about our own day and all these events I was just categorizing here at the beginning. And you may think of other bad things that are going on in the world as well. It's important to emphasize not to be fearful and not to retreat in the face of all this. I worry about many today, and it's actually been on my heart for the last several weeks, that too many, especially those who um, belong to God, are, are taking this route. That out of fear, they're retreating into their own homes or their own communities. And, you know, retreating your homes, unfortunately, it's become so convenient to do so because of the lockdowns we've faced over, with COVID over the last year and a half. The world has been built to service us being locked down. How many more people use Amazon or some other delivery service or do their shopping online, have their groceries delivered or, um, you know, are using DoorDash or Grubhub or these apps to have things just brought to your home so you don't have to go out? Many of us have adjusted to these types of things. So it's become easier to do so, but we have to be careful not to retreat into our homes. Likewise, we can't retreat into our own minds or the minds of others that simply agree with us and stop engaging with the world. You have to worry about groupthink taking place, that you know the group begins to think one way, that you become blind to all the faults of that group. We can't even desire, we can't, we have to even be careful not to just simply retreat into our own communities. Now, our communities certainly are a safe haven in these times. Rosh Pina, I hope, is one of those safe havens, but we can't become a community that just shuts itself off entirely to the world. I've spoken before about, you know, every time I go down to Holmes County in Amish country, that there's a desire in me to like, yeah, I'd like to kind of live like they do, in the sense of being shut off from the world, being self-sufficient as a community, uh, just being among the like-minded, but that's not what God says to us. Like I said, I've been thinking about this a lot because I've been worried, I've actually been in my prayers, I've been praying that the tendency to want to retreat into our own homes, our own minds, our own communities, could the enemy, enemy be using this and trying to st um, stoke the fear that's out there, especially among the followers of God, in order to silence them? At a time when the world needs to hear the gospel and the good news um, of what Yeshua has done for us and God's love for us, that the nations need to hear this most now, especially if judgment is coming. Is the enemy, would the enemy be using fear to, for the people who would be proclaiming the gospel to shut up and, and retreat in their own homes? We need to guard ourselves against that. Now, turning to Psalm 46, again, where we get the commandment, the origin of this command, be still and know that I am God. We're going to go through this, um, like I said, this verse, we're going to go through this psalm verse by verse. Now, this verse, of course, is not being sung in, sung in direct reference. The psalm is not being sung in direct reference to the events confronting Jeremiah or the people of Judah. It's not being sung directly to, ours, to our events either, but the message is the same. Therefore, let's start just by hearing what the psalmist wrote, and then, like I said, we'll go through verse by verse for clearer understanding. God is our refuge and strength, a very ready help in trouble. 
Therefore we will not fear, though the earth shakes and the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. There is a river whose streams make the city of God happy, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, and she will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar, the kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice, the earth quaked. The Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has inflicted horrific events on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. Stop striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. The Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Now when we look at this psalm, especially for those who are following along, not through the verses that were sent out this morning, but if you have your Bibles open, you'll notice that there's actually an instruction before you get into verse 1. Um, and so, and you, you, when you read the Psalms, you'll notice that sometimes there's these line of instruction. Essentially, it's a line telling the reader how the Psalm is supposed to be sung. And so the Psalm opens with um, this instruction that is to be sung upon Alamoth. Now, it's not quite certain what Alamoth specifically meant. And there's a debate that seems to be that it's either referring to that the voice, the one who sings this song, should be a soprano, it should be a high-pitched voice, or that when it's sung, it's played, the, the instrument that maybe accompany the singing of it, it should be a high-pitched instrument. So Alamoth brings this meaning that um, it's expressing the style of this song, of how it's supposed to be um, sung. And so this high pitch is supposed to accompany it, whether again it's the high pitched voice or it's a high pitched instrument that goes along with it. And what this is supposed to suggest is that it's supposed to evoke the idea that this psalm is being sung, sung by a young woman of marrying age. Now of course in that culture that means a teenage girl is who you, you should envision singing this song. And we know this because though the exact meaning of Alamoth is lost, we know it's derived from the Hebrew, root, Hebrew word Alma, which means a woman, it's usually a woman that's assumed to be a virgin, who's of marrying age and who is still under the protection of her father. And I believe this style is mentioned here, it's intentional because it sets the mood for the entire psalm. And that we, we should see that when we read these words, that they're being spoken as if it's a teenage girl who is speaking these words to her father. A father whom she's dependent on for both her physical protection and her material support. So as we go through this, again, think of that as a teenage girl who's, who's addressing her father with these words. And, and, you know, again, her father is her covering at this point. She's not married, so she doesn't have a husband. She relies upon her father for almost everything. So that with this in mind, the psalm says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in our trouble. So it's a clear acknowledgement that God is both our refuge, he's our shelter, he's our strength, he, he is an abundantly found helper, which is actually the more literal translation of when, when I read a very present help. He's an abundantly found helper during tri times of trouble and distress. So again, think of this teenage daughter speaking or singing to her father these words saying that whenever there's a threat to me, whenever I feel threatened by something in the world, you there my father, you are the one there to shelter me. And you shelter me from it and you give me strength to face it. And this should be our view of God. This is what the psalm is saying. This is our, should be all of our views of God when we are threatened when we feel that we should turn to God immediately because he's the rock and the refuge. He's the one who protects us and provides for us. Verses 2 through 3 continue, therefore we will not fear even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake, the mountains shake with its swelling, Salah. 
So with this view of God and our relationship to him, again, God is our father, is our protector and our provider. It's acknowledged that we will not succumb to fear. And when troubles arise, no matter how tragic or how threatening they appear to be, we are not going to fight, but we're also not going to flee. We're not going to stand in paralysis either, just stunned like, you know, like, like a possum and just fall over. Rather, we're going to rely on him for our protection. Now we can take the statements of these verses literally. And that it, even if there are earthquakes, we have the example in the world today with Haiti with an earthquake struck by it. That even if there are literal earthquakes and the very foundations of the earth and the mountains are moved and the buildings around us are collapsing, we will remain still under his protection. However, we can also take the, these words symbolically, especially as it relates to us today. And that mountains are often metaphors for nations and prophetic visions and writings. Therefore, even if nations are being moved about, some overthrown, some falling apart, while other new ones arise. Again, we're seeing that today. We are not to be fearful of these actions around us. Now, we lived in, a post, in the post-war, the post-Cold War security and stability that the United States forged in the world. And that's been a blessing to us. But if its foundations crumble, and it does appear that that Pax Americana, as it's often called, that the, 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 the peace, and there's been fighting, but the overall world peace that we, we haven't seen a world war in, since the 1940s, that if that is now crumbling, and we're now going to be thrown back into turmoil and war, Pre-1945, read your history of the, of the 1900s and the war in the world up until the end of World War II. It's one war right after another as world powers clash against each other. If that's what we're heading back into, again, we see maybe Afghanistan is a sign of this. We're not to fall into worry and despair since our foundation for protection is not supposed to be based upon some military strength of a nation or some government official and who's leading it. After all, even if the United States ceased to exist tomorrow, God says we, shouldn't, we should not fear. Because while we are U.S. citizens and, it's, and we take pride in that, we have to remember we belong to a king and to a nation that is not of this earth. And that that king's kingdom will, does not pass away. On a more personal level, we could even look at the moving of mountains. That this could represent significant changes in the companies or the organizations for which we work. The social circles in which we interact or disruptions of our communities and neighborhoods due to local disagreements. Again, I think about the disruptions and the arguing that we see in our communities in response to the pandemic. This could, these words could also speak to our need to move to a different, um, it could speak to our need to move to a different place due to unforeseen, unforeseen or unwelcomed events, whether that be a literal, literal physical one or a metaphorical change to a new phase in our lives. In these personal situations, we likewise are not supposed to worry about our security and whom we belong to. Verses 4 and 5 continue, There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The psalmist makes this very point that we are not to be made fearful by the events that surround us by saying that there's a river that supplies joy to the city of God. Here again, this could take on multiple meanings. Now, keep in mind, in the ancient world, a river is the physical supplier of life to a city. These ancient agrarian societies, the, rivers, the, the, the cities only pop up where there's a water source. That water source truly is a source of life there. So, when we, read, we hear these, um, these verses, it could be speaking about the city of God where his presence dwells as seen in the physical city of Jerusalem when the first temple um, was there and his physical presence truly did fill the temple. The river is the waters of the spring named Shaloah that existed, that existed in the city of, um, of Jerusalem in which the people drank from. We also though can see, not we can look at that, that physical, but we can also see to a future 
the future New Jerusalem, and maybe it's describing that, how that we, the people of God, will dwell in God's city and we will be nourished by his waters um, that, that flow from there. We see this image of the New Jerusalem found in Revelation 22, 1 through 5. And he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There were no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bond servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illuminate them, and they will reign forever and ever. So these verses 4 or 5 here, we see how it could take a physical, literal meaning of Jerusalem in the days of the kings. It could, take a, it could be pointing to the new Jerusalem when we will reside in the, um, with God and the Lamb there. We could also apply it to our spiritual walk with God now and how we are nourished and protected by his Holy Spirit as Yeshua proclaimed in John 7, 37 through 39. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Yeshua stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scriptures said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he said in reference to the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Yeshua was not yet glorified. So thus as the world around us appears to be in uproar and falling apart, the dwelling place of God's people, that is those who dwell in his spirit, that our dwelling place is ultimately in his presence and when we're there we're not to be moved. We will have security to stand fast regardless of what happens around us if we are there in his presence. Think of Paul when the prison collapsed around him. He didn't run, he didn't flee. There was a little earthquake that caused the walls to fall and he could have just ran from his imprisonment. He stays there because he, was, he knew, I, be still and know, he knew who God was. And this security will last throughout the darkness until the darkness is itself is dispelled. That's what verse, in verse 5 of Psalm 46 it's um, alluding to. The allusion to the break of dawn signifies that God's protection will be complete throughout the entire night and throughout all the troubles. Verses 6 through 9 and 11 then in um, Psalm 46. The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. His utter, he uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Salah. Come, behold the works of the Lord who has made desolations in the earth, who makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow, the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. The Lord of hosts is with us. The Lord of Jacob is our refuge, Salah. So we then go back to the nations being engaged and thrown about in war in these words. But now we see the sovereignty that God has over these nations being proclaimed. Simply by speaking, the psalm says, those nations fall before him. By the very utterance of his voice, they're destroyed. This calls back to the fact that any power that any nation or any individual holds is only because God has allowed it. No one, even though we may become upset and dismayed by the people, the authorities that we see in the world who seem to be running things, know that they are only in those positions because God has allowed it. And as such, he, as the creator, can disallow it at any time that he, they, that he sees as appropriate. Verse 6 here is a nice parallel to Psalm 33, 9, which speaks this way of creation. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stirred, stood firm. God spoke and it was done. The creation leapt forth simply by the, by the utterance of his words. Like, but likewise, God can speak again and the creation can melt away. And thus we see why we could be secure under his protection. For in his sovereignty, nothing can stand against him. Not only is there no power in all of existence that can surpass God, but there's really no power that can even challenge him. It's all underneath his feet. And this is the authority under which we have placed ourselves 
if we belong to Yeshua. And that no wonder then why Yeshua always taught about not worrying about tomorrow. Tomorrow only comes forth by the will of our master. Well, you woke up this morning because God willed it. The sun came over the horizon this morning because God willed it. The earth continues to spin on its axis. The, the, you know, all the laws of physics and nature continue to run as they always have because God has willed it. And again, it could all melt away if God so desired simply by uttering one word. If God is with us, who can be against us? If he is our refuge, why would we need to fight? Why would we need to flee? Why would we allow paralysis to strike us? Unless he's instructed as such. There are times God does instruct to fight or to flee or to, you know, to not do anything. But why would we do any of it on our own without that instruction coming first? Um, Psalm continues, verse 10, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Thus, in verse 10 here, we see, we have the summary of this entire psalm. Be still and know that I am God. Yet the command to be still in English does not fully express what is being spoken here in the Hebrew. For Rapha means to be still and to listen. It's not, again, it's not just paralysis where you just freeze. It's st be still, listen. But it even carries an additional meaning. To be still, to be listened, and to let it drop. Let it go. Which is essential to, underst to understand what the psalmist is expressing about our relationship here with God. Let it go. Not let it go like from the movie Frozen, which was all about letting go of your inhibitions and letting your true self and desires come forth. It's the exact opposite of that. That's why let it drop is actually probably the better thing to say rather than let it go. All that you're feeling inside, that is the fear, the anger, the desire to retreat and to hide, the desire to go out and fight, all of that needs to be dropped. Every natural inclination of your flesh needs to be dropped because all of those reactions are a desire on our part to want to control the situation. Even retreating is trying to control the situation because at least if I can retreat into the shell of my home, I can shut out the rest of the world and I have control of that little home. But we've got to let that go. We've got to let it drop. So what we're really, what the psalm is really saying here, the commandment is, be still, listen, and drop it. And then the important follow-up to this is to know that I am God. And we've discussed what it means before to, to what does it actually mean to know. In the Hebrew, it's not just knowing facts. It's not just knowing something like one might know about the date of the Battle of Dunkirk, or you know, how does um, hydrogen bond to oxygen to form a molecule of water? It's not knowing facts. To know God is both to be, perceive God and to be acquainted with Him. Therefore, in knowing that He is God, we should perceive that He is Elohim, or literally, that He is the supreme and ultimate so sovereign power. That he is the creator. He's the ancient of days who sits upon the heavenly throne. He is the alpha and the omega. The one who was, who is, and who will be. But again, just don't know this as a distant fact about God. Don't know it because, oh, well, scripture says that and so I believe it. Perceive it. See it in your life. See it in your relationships with others and ultimately with him. And therefore, that saying in this, you have to have a relationship with him. So you have to become intimately acquainted with him through experiences. As I said, this psalm, Psalm 46, the mood, the style of it is to be read as a teenage daughter speaking to her father. In this, it is assumed that he, the father, is familiar to her. And that she has a relationship that binds her to him. 
And through all of that, she has seen, she has experienced his authority, his ability to protect her and, her, and his ability to provide for her. This is how we are to be with God. We should be able to trust that he will be our refuge during times of trouble when the world around us is that boiling pot about ready to spill over and scorch everything. Because we should be acquainted with his word, we should be acquainted with his promises, and we should be acquainted with what he's done in the past for his people. Not just the past that we read about in scripture, but in our own pasts. And what we have seen in the past and through his promises is exactly what the psalmist says will occur. God will be exalted. He'll be raised or lifted high among the nations of the entire earth. Here again though, not because of anything we do. Not because we are still and drop it. Not because we know God, but only because he is God. And as such, he is sovereign, not only over those that are counted among his people, but he's, oh, he is sovereign over all the nations. When Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, he expressed the very sentiments of Psalm 46, but in very different words. He does so when he states in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. And he has, and he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Messiah may dwell in me. Therefore, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in distresses, in persecutions, in difficulties, in behalf of Messiah. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul understood that God's grace was sufficient strength for him to carry out and complete whatever apostolic task the Spirit led him to. Again, it's why when the earthquake happens, the, the prison falls around him, his instinct wasn't to get up and run and free, uh, uh, run and, be, uh, and flee the place and be free. It was to stay right where he was because he wasn't moved by the Spirit to leave that place. And he became even a greater testimony to those who found him and were amazed that next day that he didn't flee. Paul understood that it was when he was in his weakness, where he knew that his own strengths and his own abilities were insufficient, that's where it was easiest for him to drop it and rely on God. To re and to rely specifically on God as he knew him through Yeshua. Furthermore, when Paul speaks of God's grace being sufficient, we have to realize that he's not speaking exclusively of the grace of God that provides salvation from sin and death. And I've, I've taught this before, but we always have to remember when we read the word grace in the English, in the New Testament, we, the, the inclination is to automatically think salvation. But grace simply means God's favor. And thus it is having God's favor, which is given to us by the Mashiach. It was, it's that which allowed Paul to overcome the fears that he had, the weaknesses he had, and to even overcome the thorn in the flesh that he spoke of. And that favor is our spiritual citizenship among God's people, which avails us to the nourishment and the supply of the river of living water. God's favor is what makes us the young maiden under her father's authority, who looks to him for both protection and substance. And this is the attitude all of us need today as we look at the world around us and the trials and the tribulations that exist out there, but also in our personal lives. Now it's actually normal for most people when confronted with a crisis to look for someone else to take charge and give direction on what to do. Researchers, actually, they've, they, researchers have studied this and they've actually said about four out of five people when something happens, when they, um, you know, something occurs, the, the, inc the, the instinct is to look for a leader, to look for someone to tell you what to do. At least about 80% of the people do that. In other words, there, there's this natural instinct in most of us to be still and go to an authority and look for that leader that they can follow. Now interestingly, this is exactly what God wants us to do. But rather than again looking for people, looking to people for that leadership, we should already know who is sovereign and who is king. And we should automatically, don't look to a, a political leader, don't look to a religious leader, don't look to some political commentator on the TV that you like to listen to. Look to God alone. Now, like I said, four and five people instinctively look to someone else. 
in a, in a matter of a crisis. That means one in five don't, though. And if you're one of those five, one in five who instinctively step into the leadership role, you look to yourself to make a decision, you actually have the much more difficult habit to break because you have to give up, you have to let go of relying on yourself, relying on yourself to come up with a solution or an action. And instead, you need to drop it and look to God as well. The, re the research, interestingly, also shows that 20% that automatically like step into leadership roles in a crisis moment, they split about evenly that half make good, correct decisions, the other half make like horrible decisions. They do exactly the opposite of what you should do in a situation. So when you do look to leaders, remember half of them are probably going to make the wrong choices. Now as a concluding note, this is an important teaching not only to inform us of how we should view and react to the boiling pot in which the world is currently cast, but it should also caution us from running to and fro on the internet or to television or whatever source you use for information, to always be seeking an explanation from someone who claims that they understand what's going on in the world, that they um, have the answers. They, and oftentimes it seems in today's world, that they have the hidden knowledge that some, that some dark authority is trying to hide from you. Especially we have to be cautious to not run to and fro to religious leaders, to ministers that, um, that seem to be out there today surrounding us with end time prophecies. Like I said, this is a caution against politicians, social commentators, professional experts, especially internet experts who do the same in trying to explain everything and how everything's going to come to an end. But we also have to watch those religious leaders. I'm not saying ignore them, I'm not saying don't give them a sounding, but I'm saying be cautious. Now why do I say this? Well first, ask yourself, why do people, and maybe even yourself, why do you always, why are you often seeking interpretations and messages? What is it that you hope to find from them? Are you seeking understanding, comfort, security, control? Now keep in mind the command to be still, meaning be still, listen, drop it. And then here its meaning echoed in the words of Yeshua in Luke 17, 20 through 23. Now he was questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming. And he answered them and said, The kingdom of God is not coming with signs that can be observed. Nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. And he said to the disciples, The days will come when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man. Of man and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here or look here. Do not leave and do not run after them. The kingdom of God comes not with observation, or better stated, it comes not with an outward showing that people can easily discern. And furthermore, go not after them that say, see here, see there. Don't go after them that say, it's gonna play out this way, or you know, that and so, I, I, I have to admit, I'm astonished by how many people in the last year, the last nine months, that I've seen on the internet claiming God told me this, God showed it this way, that, or, or, or I've got this hidden knowledge, whether it be from God or from other sources in the world, that things are going to play out this way, and they're wrong time after time after time, and it never plays out the way it's said, and yet the people continue to go right back to them and listen for the next message. There's always this promise, well, in two weeks, things are going to change. Two weeks come, two weeks, things are going to change. Two weeks go, two weeks, things are going to change. I don't understand why people keep going back to these same sources. Instead of doing all this, be still. Listen, drop it, and know that I am God. And in doing so, if you need to run anywhere during these times of trouble and distress, whether globally or personally, run to the scriptures. That's where you're going to know God. Be still and listen to his word. Let go of your worries and your desire to control the situation around you and simply submit to his voice. Seek the scriptures which instruct you on who God is, what his promises are, what your relationship to the Father is, and what he expects of you. The people in Jeremiah's day, and again, 
we have to realize different situations may God may command different things. But the people in Jeremiah's day that were going to see their kingdom, their life, everything they knew completely destroyed by the Babylonians. What did God tell them? Accept it. Don't flee. Don't flee down to Egypt. There was people that thought, there was Jews that thought about doing that. God told them not to. The, he said, don't fight it. There were people who tried to rebel after the Babylonians took over and destroyed the temple and the city. God said, no, don't fight it. This is my will. This is my judgment. Seventy years are going to pass and then, you know, you know, the exiles will be able to begin to return. The temple will be rebuilt. But you who stay in the land, just stay there. Farm your fields. Raise your families, marry, marry, continue to marry, continue to have children, continue to live your lives. Because at the end of the day, what are we all ultimately expected to do? Read the end of Ecclesiastes. What does Solomon say? What is the point of life? Essentially to follow the commandments of God. I want to close today with the Psalm 37, verses 3 through 9. Trust in the Lord and do good. Live in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will do it. He will bring out your righteousness as the light, and your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not get upset because of one who is successful in his way, because of the person who carries out wicked schemes. Cease from anger and abandon wrath. Do not get upset. It leads only to evil doing, for evil doers will be eliminated. But those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. Amen. It's our duty to praise the master of all, to ascribe greatness to the author of creation. For he made us unlike the nations of the lands, and has not placed us like the families of the earth. He has not made our portion like theirs, and our lot like all their multitudes. And we bend the knee and bow, and acknowledge our thanks before the king over kings, the holy one, blessed be he. He stretches out heaven, establishes earth's foundation, and the seat of his glory is in the heavens above, and the presence of his power is in the most exalted heights. He is our God, there is none other. True is our king, there is nothing beside him. As it is written in his Torah, and you shall know this day and take to your heart that the Lord he is God in the heavens above and on the earth below. There is none other. Amen. stand together.
Thank you for this day, Father. We thank you for your presence in this room, Lord, as we worship you. We give you all the glory and the praise, Father. And we just give you everything we have this morning, Lord, as we worship you. We give you our hearts and our minds, our souls, Father, and we pray that you would come in and fill us up, Lord, and that we pour it back to you, Father.
to be overcome by your presence, Lord, in your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place, fill the your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord, in your presence, Lord. Let us become aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory troubles come, when fear clouds our vision, Father God, our understanding of who you are and what's happening. Father, we ask for an overwhelming wave of mercy that you breathe your, your ruach upon us, Father God, and chase away the clouds of doubt, Father God, the clouds of uncertainty in our lives. You are the Alpha, you are the Omega, you are the creator of us, or you called us by name, you know us, Father. We're not here by accidents, Father God, or heaven stands, Lord, you've orchestrated this. For each of us, Lord, to know you, for each of us to be called by you. Remind us of that this week, Father God. We thank you for our faith, Lord, help our unbelief, Lord. Help us in the areas of our life that we have unbelief, Father God, we have doubt in who you are, your authority in our lives. Lord, help us to be a beacon of hope to the people around us who don't know you, don't have you, who don't have a strength, a tower to run into, Lord, a, a rock to stand upon. Lord, help us to be that for them. That your love and your fortitude might echo and reflect off us and draw them to you, Father God. So increase our faith, increase our understanding today of what you're doing in our lives, what you're doing in this world right now. But we are people of faith. That's who we are. Help us to, to live that. Help us to be true to that this week. Help us to take the teaching, Father God, the word today, Lord, I'm, seared upon our consciousness this week, Father God, to strengthen our hearts with it. Help those words, Father God, echo in our in our ears and in our mind this week when we face the trouble, Lord, when we face the uncertainty. 
There's no one greater than you. There's no one greater than our God. Father God, be blessed today by us. Just be blessed by our fellowship, Lord. As we are blessed by your presence, Lord, we're blessed by your name. Father God, we're blessed by you, Lord. We ask and pray that you be our blessed by us. Watch over us, protect us as we go our ways this week. Bless those who aren't with us today, Lord, whether it be of health or travel, Lord, just be with them. Put your hand upon them, Father God. We love them. We miss them. We ask all these things in Yeshua's name, everyone said. Um, of course, we recorded the message. It'll be on YouTube and Facebook, so you can see it there. Also, the calendars are in, so if you sign up for a calendar, please see me after service, and I'll be able to give it to you. Unfortunately, and I'm going to blame COVID because we blame everything nowadays on COVID, so we'll blame on COVID, but probably because of supply chain and everything else that we're experiencing, the prices are a little higher than usual. Typically, we're under $15. This year, it actually is $20. So um, the calendars, obviously, if you have any issues with paying $20, with the calendar, please see me and we can talk about that. Um, but if not, please put the $20 in the Zadaka box um, right on the envelope uh, or the check that it is for the Rosh Pinot calendar so we can um, you know, put the funds and uh, use the funds for that specific uh, payment. But again, we have the calendar, so if you sign up for one, please see me after service. I'm assuming we have dance coming uh, 6.30 to 7.30 this Wednesday night. We have Yeshiva 7.30 to 9 o'clock, which we'll be discussing uh, Luke 21 or 20 and 21 and then we have a youth group I'm assuming uh, I'll make sure that Vera and UL uh, reach out to you if there is no youth group but let's plan on youth group this Wednesday from 7:30 to 9 o'clock as well okay as we go into Oneg let's say the blessing over the food the bracha Barukata Donai Eloheinu Melakawalam Motsi Lakamin Haretz Bashem Yeshua Mashiach Amen. Shavuot Tov.